Um, our partner, co-presenter for the All In Conference is the Urban Research Action Network. So to talk with us all about what the network is and what they've been doing, we have Ana Antunes, Tim Eatman, and Paige Bray. Over to you all. Thank you all. Um, as Chris said, um, I am Ana Antunes, and um, the three of us are the co-chairs um, for the uh, Urban Network, and I'll let everybody introduce themselves for a minute. Yeah, uh, Tim Eatman is my name. It's a pleasure to be here with you and a part of this um, amazing network of, of colleagues and scholars. I, I serve as the inaugural dean of the Honors Living Learning Community at Rutgers University, Newark. Um, and yes, yes, you met some of our scholars who are in the, in the space. Uh, and our chancellor is, is actually here. We'll hear from her tomorrow. But I'm also a professor of urban education and an educational sociologist. Good afternoon. So good to see you all. I'm Paige Bray. I'm faculty of early childhood education, University of Hartford, and the director for the Center for Montessori Studies, uh, working in the early childhood space and in community and with family. Yeah, and so just to tell you a little bit about what we are planning for today, um, Urban is a really collaborative space. So we're gonna try to keep um, our, we're gonna try to keep our, um, our talking to a minimum and give you all opportunity to participate and engage, um, you know, on the second half of the session. So um, yeah. Um, I, wanted, I want to start first um, talking a little bit about um, the history of urban. Um, we are still a pretty um, young um, collective, a really young network. Um, we um, were founded uh, in 2010 with the intent um, of honoring um, a scholar Marilyn Gittell. Um, she passed away in 2010, and a lot of the folks who had um, worked with her really um, saw the need to, you know, continue her legacy and the work that she had developed through um, this network that would honor um, the work that that um, she did. And so, through a partnership um, with Sage Publishing, um, the network was founded um, in um, 2010, um, and. Uh, on the here, on the uh, other bullet point there, um, we have a little bit of our um, uh, our uh, mission statement, which uh, talks about uh, bringing together community-engaged researchers and community leaders uh, locally to be a part of a national network where students, scholars, community members, um, activists, and artists can learn sh and share resources um, and discuss pressing issues um, of process and implications uh, of engaged research and work together um, on the basis of common values. Yeah, I, I, I want to just double down on what uh, Dr. Antunis uh, said. This really is a um, uh, an organizing opportunity for urban, like this is that. So we're going to try to get through uh, some of the comments um, and and get you, you know, sort of connecting and thinking about how you might, um, in your own sphere of influence, uh, connect with the network. So we are intentionally not trying to be the American Educational Research Association. <laughs> Or the AS, I mean, right? Like there are places for the, but there are also places for these coalitions, right? These multidisciplinary, distributed networks of publicly engaged scholars, particularly when it comes to questions of urban issues and urban policy and anchor institutions. And one of the reasons why we have these uh, uh, these folks pictured here because they they really demonstrate and exemplify the kinds of publicly engaged scholars upon which the uh, philosophy and vision of this network pivots, right? You catch Ron Glass anywhere, and he's sitting in the middle here, and he will tell you how uncouth he thinks it is that some charismatic leader would get engaged in something and hold on to it for the rest of their life. That's not what this is about. <laughs> and that's why we're so hungry to hear from you. When we think about um, you know, Mark Warren, who's in the room as well. Mark, I remember in, in, in Vancouver, 
when we had that overflow room in AERA, people just hungry to figure out how do we connect with respect to our nodes, whether they be disciplinary or geographic. And, and you know, we've been a little bit impatient with each other about the pace of development, but there's nobody who's like hired to, to work on this all the time, right? I mean, it becomes really powerful, for example, when, uh, you know, not to put my chancellor on the spot, but to, you know, she received us, no, really, for our, our retreat, you know, our spring retreat uh, a couple years ago before the pandemic, our students were involved, right? Uh, you know, she lent her thinking to how we were trying to develop that national network and to honor the elders and the way that they have been thinking about what this organizing opportunity means uh, really shows up in a whole bunch of ways. We could put a lot more pictures up here, obviously, um, uh, uh, Dr. Calderon is, a, is a, just a giant in the field, but uh, I know at that founding table was uh, Dana Cunningham and, and others who, who I don't even know. Michelle sent a message that she couldn't be here, but is always uh, quite involved uh, in the planning team. If I can reiterate anything, it really is that we are really trying to establish a model that is not top heavy, that is nimble, Bulls pull students in the mix that enables people to give life uh, to different aspects of their work. And we think that that's achievable in this uh, particular context. So we're in our second uh, uh, flow of, of co-chairs now. Like there was a, a, another band of, of third. third? Third, yeah. I don't, I don't know even how I got involved other than they said Paige was involved. So I wanted to get in and I'm going to pass it off to Paige. <laughs> Um, I definitely want to name uh, Selena Sue here as the as the chair, past chair that we all that took three of us to try to, re to <laughs> follow on her amazing work, um, and also to really also for the founders that you know the idea of the institutional, I'll say agitation, agitating institutionally. Um, and that we are able to be compassionate witnesses for each other and give perspective. You know, it's so important to have allies and colleagues in, in our work in the institutions, but it's also so important to have people who you trust and have values alignment with to be able to, you know, bounce things off of, to get a sense of like, how is my true north? You know, what, how that the quote this morning of assimilation is, um, Assimilation and it and is and the and the compromise and the compromise and we to the point of hurting our soul. It's just like that feels like every time we come together as urban, we are helping to support our humanness and the truth truth to the work we're trying to do. Not and not individually, but as a collective. Um, so one of the things we want to make sure to talk about in this group, if people have questions, maybe get some questions or feedback even right now, is one of the ways that we are supporting the work is through institutional membership. So some of us run centers, some of them tiny, some of them big, some of, uh, you know, some of them with multiple funders, some of them with a, with a few. Um, but we, one of the ways is to think about an institutional membership. Can we leverage visibility to the, in this work to various levels of administration in the same way that the dean spoke about this morning of, <laughs> thank you, uh, the dean spoke about this morning of that where's the funding? So how do we eke out spaces that give any kind of visibility to the work, that lets us bring in junior scholars, that lets us um, make that work visible? So one of the things that on the uh, flyer that was emailed out to you all is a uh, conversation about institutional membership. So we um, are really looking forward to giving that shape. Again, one of the beauties of being part of Urban is you're part of the voices of how things roll forward. So I, I get the structure slide too. <laughs> um, so I, I've already mentioned um, Selena Sue as past chair, uh, the three of us as co-chairs. One of the structural morphings we're doing is actually going to two, two co-chairs um, with a rotating sense so we have some sust sustainability and succession planning, but also to create this sort of pocket of ingenuity of, of initiatives. You know, where is their alignment in what your institution's trying to do, what you're trying to do? Maybe you're trying to be tenured and promoted. Maybe you have a funding. Maybe you are, in, this is a, in, engaging in a community work. So where is there an initiative that you can benefit from this larger collective as, as people to honor and elevate your work? And how does that then, of course, give to the collective? 
So that the structure is then, um, we're all guided by the national planning team. Um, all the nodes have people on the national planning team. I think we meet right about the amount, which is like every quarter, which is sometimes feels a little too far in between, but sometimes comes really quickly. And we're finding that rhythm um, as we all come back and work face to face. So the national planning team is then fed by those discipline nodes and by the um, geographic nodes. This has also been in the making. Uh, two of us officially found nodes <laughs> that are up there. Uh, you know, again, Tim's work institutionally is um, a great example of how it both feeds the organization, but also how it is a connect back, and especially to that student and the next generation. So we put a spot up there for uh, where you know, your node might be. So if you have any interest, and a node could be three uppity people or six calmer ones, or, uh, so just feel free to talk to any of us about what that looks like. But this is our evolving and operational structure at this moment. Yeah, and um, one of the great things about this notice structure is that work is continuously done um, locally and, inter and disciplinary. And then we come together as, um, as national planning team to um, make the connections and um, share the work that we're doing and really trying to um, build a network so that we know what's happening um, across the country. I was um, in a, a, a panel earlier um, today and they were talking about sometimes it feels like some of the work that we're doing is siloed, right? That we don't know people who are doing similar work where we feel like we're the only ones who are doing this work. Um, and this gives you an opportunity to really um, make connections and, and, and be with people who um, share values um, and, and are doing similar work that, so that that work can be strengthened through the network. I just want to thank everybody from our Santa Cruz node, our colleagues, the community. Um, you know, this is, I've been an extended remix of planning. <laughs> but this is the kind of work that all of our conferences have been this kind of work. Like there's a node that has some interest, there's some synergy. And I think that I uh, really want to make sure to acknowledge that work today. And, um, and it's a very replicable model. It's, what, it's organic and we do it with a, lot of, with a lot of talent and support. So thank you to the Santa Cruz folks for making this as amazing as it is. And Paige just did something that I was, was gonna do, was just sort of make sure that folks understand that <clears throat> you know, there have been several other conferences that mm -hmm. we've been involved with. There was a gathering in, in Boston, at University of Massachusetts mm -hmm. Boston. There was uh, one in, in New, uh, York. New, York. Uh, New York. That was the yep. first one. There was uh, one at, at Colorado, and I'm yep, Ben in the room, yeah. right? So, so you get a larger sense of what's happening here, right? So this is now uh, in partnership, you know, with our colleagues here in, in Santa Cruz, and I, I really wish that there was a way for me quickly to help you understand the gravity of what Paige just mentioned about how we take seriously being connected. Mm. I wish there were a way. I, I'm not. I don't have enough good skills to do it quickly, but it's for real. You know right. what's a good example is every time we meet, we actually always start by being human. Every time. And I, I'll be the you know, social emotional early childhood lady who says that, so <laughs> people can be uncomfortable or not. But we just always start <laughs> with being human, every with time. being real, every time. Like where are you in time and space? Which I see and know to be good practice in, in many circles, but not often or not as frequently in academic circles, certainly not ones that are driven by purpose and mission in very like fast paced ways. So I think the fact that we always start with being human and our commonness as human, uh, humans is really part of that connectedness that we've managed to even feel over Zoom, I think, um, but certainly when we're, when we're together. How are you going to work on these wicked problems and you're not even happy with the folks you're working with? <laughs> that don't make sense. <laughs> right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, so um, here is where you can find um, all that information about the nodes um, that already existed and how to join them, but also information on how to create a new node, if that's something that you're interested in. And, all of this information is also on the flyer that came with the email uh, yesterday. So, um, we just wanted to show you what our website looks like, um, and we uh, during the pandemic, one of the one of the efforts that we 
um, did was to really um, redesign the website and make sure that we were creating a space where people can share. Again, um, everything that we do in urban is with the intent of creating that network and making sure that the work that is, that the work that we're doing um, individually and collectively build on each other um, and creating the spaces so that those things can be shared, uh, that we can learn from each other, um, that we can, you know, um, support each other in any way we can. Um, and we I feel like our, our website um, is a great space um, to do that. So we wanted to make sure that you all know what it looks like um, and uh, check it out and, and um, also send us stuff because uh, the website is supposed to be like a public forum for conversations, so um, it's open. And before we go on to like specifically talk a little bit more about urban distinctions, I think it's worth a few, st I think we have a time for a few stories. So like I know, Anna, maybe you wanna talk about the youth work you've done in um, Salt Lake. I know you, um, the Hartford or Connecticut node um, has real pride in that we work outside of the academy. So we work with community engaged scholars, we work with philanthropy. You know, Connecticut is a very tiny state. Um, and so we've really made sure to create a space there. Um, I want to acknowledge my co chair, Angela Frishanti, mm -hmm. in that work um, of holding space so that we can address these wicked problems across, with across our strengths, interests, and, but with this common sense of commitment of humanity. And I think that's a really, uh, not in a task force way, not in a committee way, not in a way that those structures that wind up taking energy and resources to feed themselves to continue, but in a way that is responsive and real to the work at hand and to the work in the community, um, and to work shoulder to shoulder in that work, in the thinking work, in the doing work, in the connecting work, and sometimes the needing to retreat work, to repair, mm -hmm. and to um, focus. Um, so I, I, that's an example from Hartford of work we've been doing now. This year, we've really uh, been focusing on what, is, what does that look like to be in those intersecting spaces, and what is our common ground, and how do we um, really uh, impact some change in ways that are meaningful from community. You know, uh, how can I help? That was the question this morning, right? So in ways that really are responsive to the people um, in the community. Yeah, and we, um, the, the Utah Node is also um, gonna be sharing a work that we did, um, creating a community research uh, guidelines um, on how to do community engaged work um, at the University of Utah, which is uh, where most of us are. Um, and we're gonna be sharing that um, tomorrow on a session. Um, Kim and Anaya are here with me and they're part of our node. Um, and we're gonna be talking about that um, tomorrow as well. Um, work with um, young people um, in Colorado, um, our conference in Colorado, we had a great opportunity to have a lot of young people. I, I was able to take a group from Salt Lake to share um, an art project that we did, um, and it's, it was a, a really amazing opportunity, but it also really, um, it was really exciting for um, the high school students that I worked with to have a space where um, they were listened to by university professors in the same way that, you know, they were told to listen to um, university professors, and that was really powerful um, for them. Um, and if I may, uh, speaking of um, power and hierarchies, um, I just wanted to also, um, you know, make a point. I got involved with Urban when I was a grad student. Um, I got, I, I found, uh, I was telling uh, Paige yesterday, I found Urban at the ARA in Chicago, and it was my first time at ARA. Um, and it was before they had online guides and I registered at the table and they gave me a program that was like this thick <laughs> and said, okay, go find a session. And I uh, just didn't, right? right? Like I didn't know what to do. Um, and I s somehow stumbled on an urban session and you know, that was a handout with all of the other urban sessions in at ARA and I decided that I was gonna go all of those because it was easier than looking for the other ones on the on the booklet um, 
but I got involved then as a graduate student, um, and I, you know, um, became one of the urban co-chairs um, as a grad student. And I think there is no other organization, particularly an academic organization, where uh, my voice as a graduate student would be considered the same as a Tim, right, who is a dean. Um, there was the, there were no other place where um, our opinions would be valued as, as much or that people would take, like, you know, myself seriously um, like they did um, when I first joined Urban. So um, I've, I've gotten so much support as, uh, you know, a, a graduate student and as an emerging scholar um, from folks who've been doing this work uh, a really long time. And it was um, support that really helped me do the work that I was doing, uh, continue to see the importance of the work that I was doing. I know that as grad students, uh, often we want to do community engaged work, but there aren't people in our departments to do it. There are people who try to discourage you from doing it because they say it will take too long, you don't have time, right? Good dissertation is a done dissertation, and they just try to get you out the door. Um, and it was really important for me to find support from folks who were telling me, like, it's worth it, right? Like, it's worth it for you to, to keep trying and to keep doing something that, uh, even though there's some people telling you not to, so. This is really compelling. This is really compelling. So if you're a graduate student and you've got some good ideas about being a publicly engaged scholar, we really invite and urge you to come alongside us and to think about how your work might be taken seriously <laughs> in this context. And no brag, just facts. We have some serious scholars that are in the mix. I think uh, John is our sociology chair, John Diamond. Mm -hmm. He's giving the Brown Lecture for AR8 next week. You follow what I mean? I mean, Ron has led us into special issues of journals and Mark. Do I mean, you follow what I mean? Serious scholarship. Okay, so I, I just want to sort of punctuate what uh, Dr. Antunes has said you know, about the opportunities, you know, with this notion of how we're recognizing the need to nourish the evidentiary base of knowledge making, right? Like that's what, what's part of what, what is so important to make it happen. I think that's also happening in... Also not just graduate students, um, yes. anybody who wants to share, right? We wanna, we wanna hear from you. I yes. was looking for the 24-year-old from this morning. I was trying to see if she was in here because there would be a space. We have a space to hear for her too, right? So it could be any emerging leaders. It, it oh, could the be community grads. Organizing. Yeah, yeah, it could be right. How are we nurturing leadership in community? Yeah, I don't see um, it. As Chicago. somebody who made it through the dissertation mm -hmm. phase, asking questions, having people say, you know, just do that methodology. What do you need? That that's great. You know, just do that one. That's the one you'll get hired by. And I was like, but I don't want to work for places that want to hire me to do that. I want to do this. <laughs> so having made it through that phase, it was so important as an early scholar to have people like Ron, like Michelle, like the collective to t talk about what is, you know, how do I navigate getting this work I want to do through IRB and framing it in a way that any promotion and tenure you know, committee will look at and I can keep doing, you know, find the magic of doing the work you care about and you know, not subversive, being subversive in the institution as needed, but also keeping some sort of lifeline or you know, life, life support line in terms of where you're employed. We can't all, many of us can't give up our day jobs or we have to think about how we craft our day jobs. So um, that's been a really important part of the work too and that it's in not only in community and with community people but also people who have been thinking about things already or who have had the positions. Right. Um, had the positions to do, to do the work. I, I don't know if I can tell this story without crying but um, when we had the, uh, a conference here, that was the uh, engaged scholar, community engaged scholar work here through the center with Chris and with Ron's center, and I was sitting at lunch with Ron, and um, we were, Paulo Freire has been a huge part of my work and my, my shaping and of understanding, and, and Ron was, and I was saying, like, I'm tired, I don't want to do academia anymore. <laughs> and Ron, like, looks at me, and he's like, yeah, I tried, this is very, 
not verbatim, but he was like, yeah, basically I tried to say that to Paulo once and he <laughs> looked at me and was like, you have to stay there. You got in that room. You have a responsibility. That's where your work is because you got there. And I can't tell you how probably on a monthly basis, those words give me power to go back to those spaces because I would much rather be working with three and four year olds. <laughs> they are so much more better energy. <laughs> but I get up and I go and I teach classes and you know, it helps to support the next generation of people who will be really thoughtful with the way they work with three and four year olds and push against a system that pushes so many of us um, away from our humanity. So that's the kind of like unspoken connectedness that is such a gift and a privilege to, to be um, in this space. And just quickly, I would just build on what uh, both Anna and Paige said uh, about you know not only graduate students, but anyone. And one of the things we tried to do at Rutgers Newark is to get our students engaged. We have seven students here at the conference, right? But even as they came uh, you know, on campus, you know, we had them as scribes as part of our, um, our um, um, Retreat, you mm -hmm. know, we had them engaging with uh, uh, colleagues to learn about their stories, about their path towards academe. And frankly, we, we think that, you know, it's important to model, yeah. you know, what some of the kind of professional dispositions and practices look like, right, that, that are trying to be balanced at least, yeah. even though it's, we know it's really a challenge. And we think that that modeling is important. So we just wanted to, to name that as well in terms yeah. of the stakeholders engaged with our work. Um, and I think we've talked a lot about a lot of these points already, um, but we just want to reiterate the importance, uh, why, why we think urban is important. And one of the things uh, that for us is really important, um, you know, sometimes conferences are great and they're an opportunity to learn about other people's works, um, but oftentimes, um, you know, it's a once in a moment thing, and once when you leave, um, you know, you get a lot of people's emails, but um, you, I rarely, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you get busy with other stuff, and then you sort of go, go back to your normal life, and those connections that looked really great at the moment uh, end up not, like, um, being fruitful. And urban is a, a place, um, it's a network that allows for uh, those connections to, to continue year round, right? It's an opportunity to um, continue the work that we're starting here at the conference um, and, and, and taking it outside and continuing to make those connections um, in a way that is pr uh, uh, productive, in a way that is nurturing and fulfilling, um, but in the way that we can build off of each other. Anything else? No. Um, so, like I said, um, we want to um, we want to open up for participations and what we uh, was we were hoping you all would do is to get into small groups um, around you, um, get to know some folks around you um, and talk about um, talk about these questions, and uh, we're gonna have, um, there's a, num uh, uh, a web address there and a code where as you're having conversations um, and as you're talking about things, you can send your ideas um, up on uh, the PowerPoint. People can build from there, and then we're gonna um, open up the broader space for a conversation. So how does that feel to folks? Can we um, just so, just do that? All right, and so we want to move quickly. How, many, how much time do we have? Uh, like 15, 20 minutes. Yeah, it's four. Yeah, so let's call it 12 minutes we have, okay? So we'll, we'll reconvene in 12. But is four. everybody connected up to the website and the code? I'd like to do the, do the tech moment. <laughs> We're gonna get um, a microphone um, so that we can um, start sharing some of the ideas of what we talked about. Um, also, please continue to send um, 
uh, information to the Canva. We're going to leave uh, tomorrow. Urban is also um, hosting the networking breakfast um, at the UC Santa Cruz campus. And uh, we're going to leave um, the comments open until tomorrow morning and then, um, you know, organize some of the networking sessions or the tables um, according to what folks really want to talk about. So please continue to, um, to send thoughts um, and things that you would like to continue to have conversations about. Tim is the guardian of the mic, so whenever, and Chris. I've got a mic on this side too. So whenever you're ready to start sharing things that you were talking about. Mic check, okay. I just, um, I actually put a question up there, but I just wanted to say it out loud, which is that um, Alondra and I both work for the California Institute for Rural Studies. And um, I love the idea of this network, but it's called Urban. <laughs> is there a rural equivalent? Like, who do we connect with to talk to people in rural California or rural spaces that might be doing some of this organizing work as well. We definitely see the need for organizing researchers. We've talked talk a lot about organizing communities, but there's a, a need for organizing researchers also and are excited by this model, but where's our rural people? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd just like to respond to that in that I'm sure we could have a rural node and you would be the right person to start it. <laughs> but in, uh, with all seriousness, part of the urban commitment has always been about racial justice and about what that looks like in urban spaces. So um, in a small state like Connecticut, there are definitely uh, spaces that are rural that we connect to, but keeping in the forefront all the systemic and historic ways that brown and black people in condensed areas are systematically worked against has been, always been part of our work and in the forefront of it. Hi, my name is Noisha. Um, Going back to your comment about conferences and how we make all of these, you kind of deterred me from saying meaningful connections if people aren't going to connect with me after. Um, but you know, you get here and there's so much fruit and labor in here. Um, and for me, I came here because the support that I need is connection. And so, the support that I need looking at all of you in your face is if you connect with me to stay connected because I will stay connected with you. That's why I'm here. Mm -hmm. um, so just keep your word and connect with me. <laughs> and, and, and connect to Urban, right? I mean, and there we, have, we have amazing folks who are part of Urban here, um, but we also have amazing folks who could not be here who are also doing um, amazing work so um, the network expands beyond um, folks who are here too so and I don't know what Anna is talking about because we we connected right after she didn't throw my email away we actually got together so I, I, I don't, don't worry about that she was just I talking. really wanted a job <laughs> Sorry. Um, I just wanted to make a comment about the rural thing that has been um, under discussion in urban from the beginning, right? That the, not everybody is located in urban areas. Um, and we had many discussions over whether the name should be changed or whether the name, people would feel excluded by that name. Um, but I just want to say you should feel included and probably the majority of, uh, there are a couple thousand scholars in the urban network and they're definitely not all in cities, so. You will not be alone if you get into the urban network. You'll find a lot of other people who are working in rural areas or in small towns that are sort of in between cities and rural, right? <clears throat> so yeah, urban has space for you too. Hi, uh, my name is Chani. We are from the UCLA Labor Center. And 
one of the one of the things that we talked about was the existence of an LA node because I don't think we saw one up there, and so <laughs> we were talking about ways in which we can implement one, and that's not oh yes, <laughs> um, not just like across the UCLA campus, but across different campuses, and not just amongst students, but also faculty, staff, and other professionals, because we see a huge divide on our campus between North Campus, South Campus, like we have the social sciences versus the STEM majors, and so it's just the fact of connecting people is such a huge part of it. And not only that, I think another thing too is like, for example, at the UCLA Labor Center, we are doing research looking at young workers, young workers and learners. And for us, a huge part of our work is uplifting student voices of workers and learners mm -hmm. and making sure that those are being heard by not only other students, but also our staff, faculty, and professional members. And so I think that that's a huge part of it is just connecting different groups together. And so also a little pitch, tomorrow we are presenting <laughs> tomorrow at 11. So if anybody would like to join us, we are, oh, sorry, oopies, 1030. <laughs> um, but we are presenting tomorrow um, for our focus group analysis for workers and learners. And later on in the day, we have another section with our overarching um, overarching um, larger project, which is the Workers and Learners Project with our gallery walk. So once again, um, let's connect, and more so connect at the Workers and Learners event tomorrow, as well as with Urban, of course. <laughs> One of the things that's so rich about this is that it centers the the importance of the interdisciplinarity that we think is important as a part of urban. I just want to name that and salute you for bringing that up. Hi, um, my name is Amanda, and in my group, we you know we're a bunch of different people in different places, our career and where we work. And I think we talked about the need for overcoming isolation in this kind of work. You know, as grad students or people who aren't maybe engaging with other people doing this work and how sometimes it can be really um, feeling like you're being shut down in this kind of work or pushed in certain directions. And one, the need for like renewing and reaffirming um, our like drive to do this work and also learning different pathways and avenues um, for where we can go in this work instead of just being put into a mold of how we should do it. Um, so like learning from different career opportunities, people who have been doing this work longer in different places. Um, and so really just, and like a diversity, like not just like other grad students or other professors, but like people who do this research outside of academia and how they do it and how it fits in with um, maybe the same values that we have. Hi, thanks, I'm, I'm Mark Warren. I, I guess I'm an elder now, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> um, Anyway, I just wanted to uh, respond to the LA, um, you know, people here from LA. So uh, we do, we have had a node in LA, and we have a number of members in a node. So one of the great sides, uh, Tim was speaking of this, that we don't, we're not an organization with a lot of resources, so we depend on people, you know, volunteering. And so for a period of time, the LA node was active, and then it was difficult to maintain it. But I'm, I'm happy, and I think others, to connect you. And I actually believe that you're at the Labor Center at UCLA. I'm pretty sure the node met at the Labor Center at UCLA in its first use. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, you know, it's partly about a new generation coming forward. And so we, yeah. we welcome that. Um, and I also wanted to just make a, another small comment on the urban-rural issue. Uh, I was on the losing side of that uh, discussion about whether we should call it urban. And, but I only say that because I, this is also a place where people can come and discuss some and struggle over some questions about what really, you know, what is the difference between doing this kind of research in urban and rural areas? Is there a fundamental connection between what's going on in our urban areas and our rural areas, as well as our smaller cities? And so, you know, I think we want our network to be a place where people can have rich conversations, even if we don't have to agree all the time in the end. We're not an organization that's gonna do something. But, uh, so we definitely would, would welcome, not just you, but anybody. We wanna be a pretty diverse space, and we see the, 
the energy and the, the learning that can occur in that kind of a space. So thanks. Let me get up over here real quick, sorry. Um, hi everyone, I'm Suhei Vega, uh, Arizona State University. And actually our group had a, a good question, but we're not able to get it up there. I don't know how the disconnect, but um, was, is the node, are the nodes only for regions or can there be a node on community of practice for practitioners? Uh, because as I mentioned earlier, um, the bullshittery that we exist with in the academia is not the same as practitioners might encounter and they might have good resources for each other on getting through what they go through. I think the only hesitation, I, yes, I mean, again, we evolve as we evolve and we respond and we find needs. So yes, if that's a need and there's energy there, let's, let's come together around that. My only hesitation is, um, and I'll just use the example of Connecticut not being right, but how we've navigated that, is to make sure that we don't wind up somehow further siloing Right? So by having a geographic node or a discipline node, which that's another conversation, but it, everyone in that community with some geographic grounding is coming together and thinking and hearing and talking about those things. So it just helps to keep the silos um, down and the interdisciplinary interrelatedness and the focus on community uh, in front of us. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Andrea. I'm at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Um, one thing that we talked about that I wanted to share was the idea of really needing like our work to be respected as like one of the ways we need to be supported. Um, and saying that because a lot of us are coming from maybe places that are like, well, you can't do community engaged work. Oh, anti-racist work, you can't say that. That's too, that's too controversial or something like that. Um, and so, and yeah, it's like, why would that be controversial? But trust me, I come from a department that has raised some eyebrows at some of the research that I do because they think it's too controversial. Um, and so seeing like urban is actually quite inspiring because it's like, I want to be in a cohort of people that don't think it's too controversial that we need to shift resources from prisons to communities or something like that. Um, and now I'm actually being able to like publish those ideas and I'm gaining some respect in that way, but I have to like feed into the system to get that respect. And it's kind of like, that's, that's not the way I wanted to be respected. But um, yeah, so we talked about just like needing respect as a way of like building our own and taking care of our mental health as we're navigating all this. Hello, my name is Morgan. Um, I'm just curious, um, when you said anyone's welcome, especially community organizers, I know as like maybe, um, you know, working at a community nonprofit, I would need help from a researcher, let's say, on making an adapted evidence-based practice model work for a grant. And, you know, I can see how I can use all of your support through this network, but I'm really curious for you as researchers how you, um, ask support from me as like a community organizer and how you could see a benefit of me being in the network. Um, I think my work, I can't do my work without community organizers. Um, you know, I, I, and we were talking a little bit about that um, in the session that we were earlier today. Um, um, I think as researchers, we have tools um, that we can um, give and share, um, but and sometimes we get very, you know, academia can be, you know, uh, a lot of bu bureaucracy and a lot of and a lot of times. I mean, it is really to our community partners that we learn like about about the things that needed to happen, about the things that are happening on the on the ground. I mean, I think. Um, community organizers are um, a vital part of the work that Urban does. Um, I don't think any of us would have, like, would do, would be able to do our jobs without, um, 
community organizers. So, um, I mean, I feel like we get more from you than you get from us, but you know. <laughs> I think it's also that co-construction, right? So the, at the Center for Montessori Studies, we sort of tagline practitioners and researchers working together because in early childhood, you have you know, all these theories and brain research and all this stuff opening over here. And then you have people with small, fast moving people who often projectile physical you know, bodily fluids trying to get through a day. So, you know, we really need to think about practitioners and researchers working together. So in that way, um, I think it keeps us all honest. Again, it keeps us focused on what are we trying to address or do better. Um, and um, I know there's other people in the room who can speak to this as well, but I think it's really important to understand how those things support each other. So. I'm so glad that, that you mentioned this because one of the, the so the metaphor of the ivory tower, right, is what? It's like being removed <laughs> from community, right? And so what we feel in this effort, and this is not the only one, there are many of them, right, is a respect and an affirmation for that community indigenous-based knowledge. Do you follow me? It came up in several ways over here. The sister says something about the need to affirm knowledge. There is a cognizance of the power of that metaphor and how it operates within our gestalt. Do you follow what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So this is a really important question and I'm glad you raised it and I'm sure several of us could talk about, about that. I think Steve had his hand up. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, I think someone, someone back here had their hand up before me. But... Okay, um, so my question is, um, whether or not, I, don't, I wasn't able to look at the website yet, but I'm curious as to whether the website and these resources are available in other languages. Because I know that within communities, you know, there are people who either are, don't speak English or um, are English as a second language speakers, right? So I'm curious as to how, you, how Urban engages with people or gets people in their nodes who do not speak English or for whom that might, English might be, be a barrier for. Yes. As somebody who works internationally, I think that that's part of our work in the sense that we have, for the most part, we do conform to a construct of working in English because most of us work in English in our in the professions and then by node, by location, by shared co-constructed work, we understand how we need to make that broader and more inclusive. But um, it is true that for the most part, we are privileging English as our main operational piece uh, as a system. But then how we express that and how that plays out in community is very particular and I, th I think it's fair to say is responsive. Hi, I was, excuse me, my, uh, <laughs> my name's Ben. Uh, I was gonna speak to the comment prior about organizers and how organizers or community-based people in general uh, can benefit from being part of urban. And I'll just speak from my experience from Colorado. Uh, just two comments. One is what I've seen is that people who lead community organizations or are community organizers often will form relationships and connect with scholars who share their values and understand kind of the work of community organizing and can be good partners for work. So that's one possible benefit. Another that I've experienced in Colorado is that most of our most active members um, would identify as both researchers and organizers. And so there's not an obvious distinction um, for, you know, for a lot of them, which is a good thing. So it just it makes those conversations can feel very natural. Um, because in some cases they may have been community organizers in neighborhoods and then went and studied or vice versa or they're organizing you know, in their university, et cetera. So there's, there's a lot of back and forth there is what I've seen in, in Colorado. So also I would wanna say people who identify as organizers or educators or they're not in a university, I would also wanna welcome you to, to Urban. Mm -hmm. But it probably plays out differently in different local nodes. Just to your comment about language, I think language is very important that, you know, uh, because as she said, most of the community organizing that you work with, they have a group that they don't speak English as the first language. Mm -hmm. So um, my comment would be not only that, 
to you and to all the researchers in the room, please, when you deal with community organizing that the English is their second language, also don't use those like fancy word that <laughs> sometimes we don't like really cannot even understand what you meant by a question. Mm -hmm. Talk to us in the language that we can, like in simple language that we can understand. Especially somebody like me, English is the like, second language, I always tell like my coworker Kelly, like sometimes there is one word in the whole questions that get me. So I don't understand that word because it's super fancy word. For the first time I heard it, I know that researchers and professor, like professor, they like to use those fancy words. <laughs> but yes, do that with the people that you deal with all the time. But when you connect with like community organization, please use a language that can be simple for us because there is many languages can give you the same meaning, but you don't have to be fancy. So <laughs> You, you know, English, um, English is my second language too, and I always tell my students that when I started grad school, there were a bunch of words that I didn't understand and never asked because I thought everybody knew what they were, and one of them was like epistemology. I, it took me three years to, <laughs> to learn what it was while I was in grad school, and I just, so every time I teach, the first thing I do is like explain that word because I was like, it took me three years to learn it, so I'm going to tell it to you because I never asked, you know, so I hear you. <laughs> Hello everyone, thank you for all for sharing. And uh, my name is Augustine, or I go by Augie. Um, uh, the amazing work that you guys are all uh, sharing is really amazing, but I just thinking as the folks that have been, I'm just picking back off those questions, like a network to me meaning inclusive, inclusive to everyone. So what does this actually network really mean? Because it's being exclusive and only being uh, exclusive to English speakers, but when we're out in the community and we're talking about community, we also got to make sure that we're pre representing our youth, our communities, our own house, our, everyone that doesn't have access to technology, access to these research or uh, accessibility to all these networks because they're at the forefront at, at these, uh, you know, health concerns or disparities. So I do want to make a quick suggestion and making it more inclusive when it comes to networking because that's something that I still feel exclusive in a way. So, mm -hmm. thank you. Me again. Um, I guess to piggyback off my question earlier a little bit, the reason I ask why you see you can benefit from a community organizer, just because I work for a native nonprofit and just I'm a little weary and hesitant because I don't want a researcher to ask me how to approach my community. Right. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I just want to, yeah, so maybe it's like I can offer you, like, you know, if you're asking, like, you're really looking forward to this project, do you have any suggestions since you've done youth programs? I could see that being, like, a mutual benefit, but, you know, like, at first I was like, ooh, research, I don't want to be researched on or have, you know, elevator pitch to my community, so that's the whole reason I asked that question, if you have any examples, maybe, or just something like that. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, definitely, and that, that is not what um, urban is about, right? And we all, um, you know, are also very protective of the communities that we work with, right? Like, the, about the relationships that we've developed with people. So, um, yeah, it, it, it would never be, oh, I know this person, let me ask them, and, you know, and, um, but uh, our hope is that relationships would, it, develop, right, and that you would get to a point where you can work with folks, but not because they're trying to take advantage of you and your community, but because you have shared, like, goals and objectives, and then you build a relationship over time. Yeah. I feel like Michelle would say here, the, uh, the work that she's done um, with the Public Science Project and how we come together and support each other, right? So there's a way that you, like your example, you want data, it helps you do something, right? <laughs> um, how do we, use, how do we under, how do we do authentic work that is really addressing real questions or real uh, shared um, inquiry? I'll use the word inquiry to uh, de 
unpack the research word. So I think that we have a great examples of how we do that, but it's, it's hard work. Like I totally take the call in about language, and yet I feel like one of the things I'm so proud of Urban doing is the way that we disseminate includes a whole range of helping people make sure that it, we, can, we could spend two hours in a room deciding if we're scholar researchers, researcher scholars, scholar activists, like, you know, they're like 72 titles, and then there's a way that that's important for identity, and we also make sure to spend the time to be doing what I will call real work, right? The work. So I think that's, that's all part of the tension and part of the evolution, which is what has always been exciting to me about being part of Urban, is it's, it's being in that flow. Yeah, th this question, just quickly, this question <clears throat> brings us back to the kind of introspective work mm -hmm. that we feel we need to do. I mean, you heard us mention, um, you know, earlier in the, the, the presentation that, you know, connecting is important to us, like mm -hmm. actually, right? And so um, I think that one of the things that that telegraphs is that we're not trying to just be transactional. Right? We recognize that institutions have been extracting, mm -hmm. you know, and honestly, you know, like, like my story is not even possible without understanding some of that extraction that has happened from institutions within my community. I won't go into the details of that, right? But like we get that. Mm -hmm. and, and the point is that so many of us have been trained to think that way. And sometimes I'm walking around like, oh man, why, why am I doing that? Mm -hmm. Th that is not the right way to do it, we got this great project on reparations going on. Like, what would Newarkers imagine reparations could look like, right? And it's really, really, I wish I could talk about it here, but it, it requires us to take a certain posture. I was sitting at a woman's dinner table last week during a community dialogue, one of our HLLC scholars, right, who brought together community partners. And, you know, they kept saying, what do you want to, I said, I just want to listen. I want to become part of this network. I'm not from New. I don't lay my head down there at night. I'm going on too long, but I really appreciate you surfacing that. It looks like uh, Dr. Warren has a mic. Hi, Mark again. It's always a mistake to talk after Tim, because <laughs> I don't have that. Um, I, obviously, this question is bringing up a lot of energy, and uh, so I think it's important. I just wanted to share um, my way of looking at it, and I think it's maybe true also of many people, many of the scholars, mainly identified as scholars in our network. So, you know, why am I a scholar? Like, why do I do the work that I do? And it's because I believe that this is my contribution to a movement that's going to transform our institutions away from racism and white supremacy Ooh. towards justice and liberation. That's why I do the work that I do. And I'm not, I'm not going to do that alone, and scholars aren't going to do that alone. It's community organizations, it's movements, these kinds of struggles that are really going to create the power to transform our institutions. And we believe we have an important role to play, otherwise we wouldn't be doing what we're doing. Right? Speaking for myself, I believe that scholars can play an important role in that. But the reason that I want to work with and welcome community organizers is because, you know, I'm, I can't do, you know, my liberation is connected up with other people's liberation. And I'm a white man doing this work. And so, you know, this is something that I've thought about a lot and worked towards in my life. So I think there's a level at which what is really the larger purpose of what is bringing us here today. And I, for me, it's building a movement for, you know, educational justice and community liberation. And that's why I want community organizers. That's why I work with community organizers. Uh, Dr. Warren, before you sit down, uh, <laughs> can I just can I poke poke you a little bit? Um, sure. Is, isn't there a book project out <laughs> that uh, reflects much of what you just said that also manifested in the spoken word presentation this morning? Would, would you say a word about that project? Well, yeah, we're, we're actually going to talk about it uh, on Friday morning. Tease them, brother. Yeah. Tease them. Okay. <laughs> No, uh, you know, and uh, so I, I work with uh, a network of community organizers, mostly organizers of color and parents and young people of color working or to dismantle the school to prison pipeline and for educational justice. And so we put together a book called Willful Defiance, uh, the movement to dismantle the school to prison pipeline. It's a collaborative, it's a collaborative, right. and it's a collaborative research project and we're, we're trying to figure out and as many people are here, what are the ways in which scholarship and research can be done in deep partnership in a way, in a book that can actually support and be a resource toward the movement? 
and, and we also have an arts piece. So the, the spoken word uh, poets and community educators, Patrice and Coco, who started us off, they were talking about Willful Defiance. They, they did a spoken word poetry piece on Willful Defiance and also lift us up. So that was part of what was happening in the opening session. So we want to talk Friday about how do you bring together scholars, organizers, parents and young people, and artists to, to build this movement and what's the role of scholarship in that. And it's not all, I mean, I think we'll be trying to lift up our successes, but there's a lot of tensions and a lot of struggles to do something like that. And uh, you know, we're not the only people trying to do it, but I think we're, we're, that's what we're experimenting towards. Thank you. Hi, your forever connection is back. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have a question for you guys. Um, in the nodes that you're in, what's the youngest person that's in it? I mean, Tim, you can speak. I, I have stu undergrad and grad students who have proximity as well as doc students at our in university and then out in yeah, community. Yeah, so yeah. Um, I would say, honestly, our span is anywhere from 18 to, I don't know. Yeah, and I also would Something. say that that, huh? I also would say that that kind of begs the question about what it means to be in a node. Yeah. Do, you, do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I'm not trying to be slippery. I'm, I'm just saying that yeah. you know, at this stage of our development, we're really trying to figure out what that rhythm looks like. Um, you know, I have students here. There are seven of them, but you know, and they've been involved. You know, with uh, um, you know, urban in different times, and some have been young as 17. But I don't know if you would consider that being in, in the node. You know, that exactly. the, the the extent to which they are. I mean, this work because it's publicly engaged scholarship. It's about in engagement across the faculty roles. It shows up in my teaching, do you, do you know what I mean? My research, my service. And, and to, the, to that extent, I would think that you know, those students in the mix are a part of that. So I know that sounds slippery, but that's, that's my, my take on it. I know you had a follow up. Yeah. Um, so I've been hearing a lot of talk about the people that's in the node being like uh, students and professors and people that seems to be in these very, like what I would call I know you're going against the institution, but institutionalized um, big names and statuses. Um, for me, I just left education to like create my own business, which plug, I'm, it's my first time speaking on it here on Friday, if you want to come. Um, but someone like me who's making that pivot, hearing and, and very interested in connecting with you guys, but there is this little part of me that's like, because I'm making a pivot and starting something new, it seems a little intimidating. So like for someone like me, how would, like what can, I, I want you to say something to make me feel comfortable to come. Please come. <laughs> I feel like there's somebody over here who might be able to respond to that, not to put her on the spot. Um, I'm Angela. For Shanti, and I'm co chair of the Connecticut Node and also on the national planning team. And I just pivoted. So I was in academia, then I was in philanthropy, so both ivory towers, and now I'm an independent scholar, still working on that word. Um, but I think to go back to something Paige said about always starting with humanity first. Um, the thing that I like about you know being part of urban is that I can always show up. We haven't said the word class, I don't think here, mm -hmm. um, but I'm a working class kid from Bridgeport. I will always be, no matter what institution I find myself part of. So being in a space where I can have whatever title, but I can still show up as who I am is really just phenomenal. It's just really incredible. But I would say it kind of crosses with the practitioner question as well and the organizer question is that if we take out the kind of professionalized words of research or scholarship, we're all in knowledge construction. We're all making it up as we go along together. So I would say come so that I don't feel alone and uh, there's a space. Hi, my name is um, Ebony. I'm. Oh my goodness. 
Hey, y'all, so that's my dean right there. So I go to Rutgers <laughs> University, uh, Newark. Um, so what I will say to um, the young lady, I didn't catch her name again, but um, what I will say is that do not be scared to boldly come into any space, right? Because I feel like for me personally, even though I'm a, a student, as well, my work started way before I got into the institution, right? Mm -hmm. So the HLLC Honors Living and Learning Community Program, let me just give you a little bit, is like um, you come in with already things that you're passionate about coming in and the work that you do. So the only way you're getting in, into the program is by doing the work beforehand, right? So I was doing the work based off of what I seen that I was sick and tired. And then I also had people around me, like my parents and like other um, mom and pop organizations who are just starting to help their community because they see the need and they see that if the networks or the big name brands aren't going to do it, we're going to do it as well. But the process to get into that, it doesn't start necessarily just by doing the work. What I was telling my group was one of our biggest problems with mom and pop organization is funding and also staying within the urban reach that we have, right? So being in this space right now not only sets a, a precedent for whatever community you're coming from and you're representing, but it also gives you information to say, hey, so what can I take that might be good for what I'm doing? And if it doesn't work and apply, we tried it, but what's the next step? And then I can come back to the next space and be like, this didn't work for my community, but what I seen happen was X, Y, and Z. How can I prevent that from happening again? And what can I use moving forward? So, and you, you might only, I'm sorry for being long winded, but you yeah. might also inspire somebody here to even say that in any description, whether it be you or um, the young lady talking about the rural um, debate that was going on, your inspiration of just coming in and not understanding um, or not standing in the whole um, gap of being a student or a researcher is something that a lot of people seem like they share that same agreement of I'm a community organizer, I'm, I'm in the rural district. It's something that it doesn't seem like it's made for them, but they're all reaching out to this space to see what they can take from it. So if you could take anything from it or from the connections or the networks that you see here, it's a benefit and it's a plus. So don't stop coming to these spaces because they definitely do help. I have a quick clarifying question because I think we've all been talking about nodes and, and this and that, but what, what goes on in a node, right? Because like I'm thinking, is there a possibility for nodes to, like, to be regional but then also have a, another, like can people exist in two different nodes so that, because what I'm hearing is a lot of the practitioners, a lot of folks that are organizers, even on the questions up here, like how do we get leaders in the community to be added? Like there's a lot of interest, I would, I think, I'm hearing from non-institutionalized, because that's what I feel like sometimes at ASU, um, <laughs> folks, and, and we might have, if it's a meeting discussing things, you know, the scholars might have a conversation of how do I work P and T, uh, tenure and promotion, mm -hmm. with this activity, but that doesn't necessarily apply to um, the, the person over here who's asking about what can I get out of it as an organizer, right? So, all that to say, what are the nodes? <laughs> like, what does that look like? And can is there possibility and room to double up in different nodes? So yes, people are in, in several nodes. <clears throat> I'm in the education node, sociology nodes, you know, and, 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 and a lot. I, I think one of the things that we have to really emphasize is the organic nature of what we're trying to do. Do, do you know what I mean? And so, you know, we don't prescribe, you know, what the nodes need to, I mean, it's like, what are, what's, what are they feeling right, right now? Do you know what I mean? What are the projects? I mean, I'm thinking of Julio and his mm -hmm. emphasis on the youth work and the grant mm -hmm. that, you know, we, we wrote. Like, so it, like, it kind of sort of, you know, moves based on how people are, are feeling and flowing. I don't know if-, if Yeah, and know. there's some nodes that meet regularly and that have events regularly that are nodes that are more focused on, like, projects, like, um, um, like Tim was saying, uh, the education node also, you know, organizes around like um, talking to other like education you node know, researchers about like the need to like um, listen to the expertise of students, right? When we're doing educational research, which um, it's still, um, you know, um, so 
each node has like a different focus um, and, and it, it shifts and changes with, with the needs. Um, and that's why we, you know, and then, but we connect through the network so that that work can continue to grow. But I know that the Boston node, for instance, does, they do a lot of events like regularly. Um, but like the Utah node, we've been focusing on creating these guidelines for community research and really creating and really mapping community um, community work that's happening around Utah. Um, you know, we, ha we, um, we have a lot of um, um, people at universities in, in rural areas, and we know a lot of the work that we are doing in Salt Lake, but we don't know a lot about the work that's happening elsewhere, so we're working on, like, doing that mapping, but different nodes are working on different things. And we have six more minutes. Okay, I'm gonna be super fast, but I just wanted to respond to the question about nodes. Um, Steve and I co-chair the sociology node, and Steve, Chris, and I triple co-chair the Santa Cruz node. And the Santa Cruz node, our primary business has been spending four years planning this conference. <laughs> I know. Um, so that's what we've been doing. Um, you know, it's funny, uh, I went to maybe my first or second I'm not a sociologist by training, but I am a sociology professor, and I went to maybe my second, first or second um, ASA, American Sociological Association meeting, and I was invited to go to the urban like morning coffee with Mark, and I'm sit Steve was at a session, I'm sitting next to Mark, and Mark leans over and he's like, so you and Steve, you're gonna take over the sociology node, right? And I was like, uh, yeah, okay, sure. And it wasn't like, you know, here's your um, list of how you go about organizing the sociology node. We expect you to have this many emails and this many conferences. It was like, you do you. And, um, you know, if you want to talk about it, that's great. And so, you know, some of the stuff that we have been doing is working on through the American Sociological Association tenure and promotion criteria and working really closely with the Sociology Action Network there. Um, so just to say, you know, like there's not one way of doing this work. There's not one set of inclusive um, or, or non-exclusive -ex or inclusive membership. It's sort of about, um, you know, how, wh what's a priority in your, at that moment in your, in your group. And I just want to echo what Paige started off by saying about humanity. Um, you know, I came from outside of academia. I've only been a professor for a few years and um, in my department, there's every single man in my department is a father, and I can count on fewer than my five fingers the number of women in my department who are mothers. Mm. And academia is not mm. a place that respects or enjoys motherhood. Mm. And I learned and appreciated and, you know, like really felt heard and understood when other people in the urban group talked about being mother scholars and how important that was to their academic identity. And it was like the very first time in my academic career that I heard motherhood uplifted. And that's like to my core who I am as a person. And so that kind of humanity is what I've gotten from Urban. Um, we are running out of time for this session. We, like we said, we will leave um, the comments um, open. You can continue to send things we will um, organize. We have the breakfast, the networking breakfast tomorrow um, at um, the Stevenson Event Center Courtyard. Um, we will be continuing this, these conversations and we will gonna use um, the topics that we generated through uh, the live chat um, as an opportunity to, um, to engage tomorrow, so. And please, just come up to us, any or all of us. Look forward to interacting. Thank you so much. <laughs>
Um, and I hope you all are feeling as full as I am, full in heart, full in mind, full in spirit, full in connection. I think it's been an incredible day. I hope you all have enjoyed it too. Um, and this is just the beginning. We have another day and a half here together. Um, tomorrow is up on the UC Santa Cruz campus for some more in-depth discussions. We have a, a couple of plenary sessions. The first plenary session is really trying to think about the university as a anchor institution and how can universities be better at being community partners, partners with the surrounding community. Chancellor of Rutgers University Newark campus, Nancy Cantor is here and will be leading that conversation um, tomorrow morning. It's gonna be a really vibrant conversation you won't wanna miss. And then in the afternoon plenary session, um, the students that you've heard um, from the Newark Honors Living Learning Community, led by Tim and the others you've heard here, are gonna be in conversation with some of our students from the John R. Lewis College here on the UC Santa Cruz campus. Um, about student involvement in community partnership and leadership. It's gonna be a really dynamic conversation. There'll be breakout sessions um, all day long as well. You've heard some of the um, ones that we're gonna have, um, <coughs> lots of exciting sessions. All of that's in the program, you can connect there. The networking breakfast tomorrow morning, um, and I, make sure you, I wanna make sure you all don't have in your mind like fancy orange juice glasses <laughs> and uh, whatever oh, caviar just... breakfast. It's just like, you know, coffee and donuts mm -hmm. and like kind of we had this morning. Um, but it's a chance to really connect and talk and talk more in depth about what it means to be, to be part of, of Urban. Um, that will start at eight o'clock up there. But what that means is that um, those of you who will be taking our bus transport need to catch the 730 bus. Um, we have a you know, large bus, we'll have a couple different runs back and forth from the Hotel Paradox up to campus. So I'd really encourage you to come to that 7.30 a.m. bus. I know it's early, but then you get to network up in a beautiful view overlooking the bay. It's really a stellar um, spot for having a, a lovely um, breakfast and, and discussion. And then there'll be a second bus that leaves at 8.15. Um, we'll start promptly at nine o'clock with the, the plenary session. Um, and if those of you are driving, there's also um, parking. Um, you can park at the very base of, of campus and there'll be um, quick shuttle buses going back up from there. That's $5 to park there. There is a parking lot up by the Stevenson um, Event Center. Uh, it's a $10 parking charge up there if, if you're doing that. Um, there is the uh, poster session tomorrow night. I'll talk more about that um, tomorrow as well. Uh, tonight's reception, is at the Museum of Art and History, 5.30 to 7.30. I actually have the wrong time there. It'll go to 7.30. Um, it's gonna be an awesome uh, performance opportunity. Um, two performances, one, Senderos is one of our local partners that's really trying to lift up uh, multiple Latino um, histories, cultures uh, of the area and the Americas uh, through dance, through art, through music. They're gonna have a dance performance for us. Um, and then there'll be a spoken word performance by uh, Daniel Summerhill. Um, he's actually the inaugural uh, poet laureate of Monterey County. Uh, mm -hmm. Poets from Oakland. He's also a, a professor for poetry and social change uh, at CSU Monterey Bay. So those are going to be really dynamic. Those performances will start at 6. The reception starts at 5.30. Um, there will be shuttle buses operating running now from the Paradox, um, if you want to go over there. I'm also... Um, it's also possible to walk. Um, it's a half mile walk. Google says it's 11 minutes. That's a fast person walking half mile. Uh, <laughs> 15, 20 minutes, something like that. Um, but uh, you know, it's a beautiful afternoon out there, a chance to walk by the um, San Lorenzo River and to walk over there. Um, you should actually walk on this. That one is closed at the moment because that's where um, our homeless, uh, unhoused residents uh, are staying at the moment, um, so you can walk down that way. It's about half a mile. Uh, and there will be shuttle buses back at the end of that period as well. And is there anything else in my notes I need to touch on? No, I think you're good. Be free, and we'll see you over at the Ma in half hour. Hey, Paul.